Right, ladies and gentlemen, they're on the way down. <coughs> Jim's going to sit down here with Marnie. We asked him if he wanted to get up on stage, but uh, no. he's a bit shy today. <coughs> right, appearing on my right, we have uh, Jamie Witter. I'm going to get Jamie to uh, do the introduction. feeling to be a turnout for this one, even though most of you should still be at work, you know what I mean? Uh, it's a real privilege for me, I've been down uh, to CMC a few times and we've had uh, real uh, good riders here like Hutchinson and, and John McGuinness and the Lowe's boys and ask them to name but a few, but this one means uh, quite a lot to me. Uh, He's a legend. For me, he's possibly amongst the five most naturally talented men ever to put his leg over a bike. Uh, we'll talk about everything he's done, and there's plenty of it. I did, I did absolutely no research for this one to know pretty much everything he's done. Please welcome Kevin Schwartz. We'll talk some shit, and then uh, if you've got a question, um, keep your powder dry. You'll get an opportunity. I'll get Ross going out with a with a mic. Um, like I said, for me this is a, a privilege. I don't. I mean, we've been chatting upstairs, and I know Kevin a little bit from I was first racing superbikes when Kevin was making his way and, and, and winning a lot of things. And I'm, I'm, I've got to say, I'm privileged. We've done battle in Macau. Yeah. Well, no, that's, we'll talk about that later. Um, but we'll start from the beginning because um, there's, there's a lot to tell about Kevin. There's probably a lot what you don't know. Uh, you start on trials. Um, Jim, where's Jim? Where's your dad? Jim's down here. Jim was a, a dealer. Explain how you got started in racing because it's a bit odd, really. Well, yeah, it wasn't really racing to start with. It was trials. But um, my parents were a Yamaha dealer in Houston, Texas. My mom, my dad, and my uncle. And we, they got Yamaha franchise in 1964 which happens to be the year I was born. Um, from there, it was pretty much every weekend and for sure every day after school. If I hadn't been a bad kid at school, I got to ride my motorcycle as soon as I got done doing any homework or acting like I did homework. So, um, yeah, it was. I didn't really like school, but I put up with it because I knew that, man, I got to go ride my motorcycle at the end of the day. So, um, from there, trials into motocross. Uh, I, tried my hand at some professional motocross and because my parents did agree that I needed to work, um, especially once I graduated high school, I didn't have time to go ride my motocross bike as often as I needed to to be able to train or compete with those guys at the top. And in 1983, a friend of mine said, try road racing. And I guess it all just kind of fell into place from there. But the, the story goes, and I've never heard it from the officer's mouth, as it were, the story goes within about a year are you, are you starting on tarmac, You've been spotted by Yoshimura, the, the, the full factory Suzuki team in the States, and you were almost, I, I don't know, um, sort of mentored by them from a really early part of your career. I, I, the race I did in 83 was right at the end of the season, and some friends of mine had, uh, being a Yamaha dealer, you guys might know, Yamaha 750 Seika, thanks, 750, so shaft drive. Hang on, hang on, we, we've got a sound, man. Bring it a bit closer to you now. That's there you go. Shaft drive. Uh, and went did one practice session, then raced it for an hour. And when I got down, I was almost as fast as my buddies who'd been racing for six or eight or ten years. And I thought, hmm. So I went home and asked mom and dad if I could have a bike to go road racing in 1984. And in 84, I, I rode an FJ 600, which I think they were XJs here. But uh, it was a really good sport bike. It, you know, it was one of the best machines in the 600 class. I could win the 600 class most places. I could be competitive in the 750, and not very often could I run at the front of the 1,000cc class as well. But just did a bunch of racing. We went endurance racing, and uh, I caught the eye of John Ulrich, who at the time worked at Cycle News. And he said, I heard Joshua Mer's looking for a rider. You want to come do a test for him? I said, yeah, sure I do. You know, well, I've only been road racing a year, but let's go see what a fast bike's all about. So. Went and tested his bike, went and tested John's bike for a day, um, and then got to ride the Yosh bike, and at the event they brought, they, they showed up, I got three laps of practice on their bike. The first race I stalled the bike, uh, got off, tried to push it, couldn't get it started. 
somebody came running out onto the grid, gave me a shove, uh, managed to catch up and win the race and break the superbike lap record in the process. And then in the second race, did install the bike and broke the superbike lap, lap record again. And since then, it's uh, it's been Suzuki uh, pretty much my entire career and Yoshimura for a, for a good part of it. Where did the link with the Suzuki UK come? Because I just got a job racing domestically for uh, Suzuki GB, and you were already on the scene, borrowing bikes off them. You did some. I seem to remember you going to Aston racing a an F1 bike uh, that they built out of a, a road going gamma, and, and you were already known in Europe, and people were already trying to get older you to, to ride the bikes at that point. It was that um, somebody asked me to ride something, I just jumped at the opportunity. And um, a gentleman by the name of Steve McLaughlin was at Daytona in 1985, and my bike broke, um, I, I, the clutch blew up on the start. So I didn't get to do any laps at all. And he said, you know what? He goes, you ought to go to the match races in 1986. We went to the match races, and I borrowed, ironically enough, Tony Rudder's TT bike. Uh, somebody <clears throat> got it, a dealer, or somebody got it for me to use. Uh, at the match races in 86. Funny enough, Barry Sheen was there doing some TV commentary and Barry watched me over the weekend and said, you know what, you really ought to stick around. I'll get you one of my 500s to ride. You can go do the race of the year. Went to the race of the year, finished second there. Uh, Roger Burnett beat me. And when we finished second at the race of the year, uh, Heron Suzuki uh, agreed to build me a bike to be able to go do Assen, Belgium, and Mizano on. And in Assen, to help learn the track, we did do the TTF1 race, and I, uh, I actually got to rub elbows with Joey Dunlop in a race, so that was pretty special. You won that, did you? No, I finished second. I passed Paul Eden in the chicane the last lap, and Mr. Eden still, I think, uh, is angry about me taking those <laughs> world championship points from him. <laughs> and then at what point did you become uh, one of the infant? Did you, did you, at that point, even then think you were gonna be did you have aspirations to be Formula GPs at that point? Yeah, I think once I got to ride a 500, I realized that really wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, I had a contract with American Suzuki for 86 and 87, but I did Grand Prix each year. And in 87, Suzuki actually came back into Grand Prix racing with a full factory effort with the RGV 500 instead of the Square 4, which is what I'd been racing up to that point. And it was just kind of a known that at the end of my 86, 87 contract, I was going to go ride for the factory. and. Uh, you know, it was, at the time in America, there were two jobs that, that really paid. Uh, I had one of them, Fred Merkel had the other one, and, uh, you know, it was just lucky being in the right place at the right time. There's so many kids, I'm sure, here in England as well, but in America, <coughs> have the talent and have the ability, but with manufacturers not supporting racing that much, you know, there's just no, not really any place for them to go, and it's, it's kind of disappointing. I wish we could... Uh, come up with that miracle cure so that we could get uh, all the kids that deserve it and have a heart and really want to try, uh, get them, give them some support. I remember uh, in Max Races 86, because I was watching it, and it rained at Donahan, and then in 87, I actually was on my own GSXR, and I got picked for the British uh, team. Slightly embarrassing that year. Um, but I remember you were Brands Arch, and you particularly weren't bothered about whether the American team won or not, which you obviously did. You just bothered about beating the other Americans. Well, uh, just other American, uh, that guy named Wayne Rainey. Yes. <laughs> from, from 1987 when we raced our first head-to-head -head battles in, uh, at Daytona. Um, ironically enough, I crashed lead in that race, 15 seconds in the lead or something. As I'm being loaded onto the stretch right here, Rainey from the podium saying, yeah, we were catching Schwanz, we were going to win that race anyway, and it was just a certain hatred that, yeah, I think still if we were racing, might still be there today, but uh, yeah, it was, well, of course, didn't, didn't we all know there was 100,000 pounds to any one rider who could win all nine rounds, so three of brands, two, three different day, or three rounds each day, two different days at, at, uh, at Donington. So the way we left it as Americans was, we, we, we're here, we got the best equipment, we should be able to win, let's run the first race and then we'll talk. Wayne and I went at it tooth and nail the first race, I won, and I don't think he's talked to me about it yet. <laughs> um, you know, there was no way he was going to let me have all the publicity and win in nine races, because he had sat at home the previous year when we came over the first year in 86, and had to listen to all the 
how great us Americans were and how good we did and da 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 da. But he was he had hurt himself in Daytona, so he couldn't come. So, um, you know, Mr. Rainey and I are friends now, but there's still not a whole lot we agree on. So what? And that carried over into family GPs. I mean, at the time, I was a kind of a, a spectator, and I knew you a little bit, but it, I thought that was kind of uh, publicity and hype, and, but I mean, that, I guess that was really, you didn't like each other. I, I, at the time, I didn't really have any reason not to like him, but yeah, he definitely didn't like me, and so I just thought it was only appropriate that I disliked him back. Uh, you know, the fact that at one point in my career I actually dated his sister for, sister for about six months probably didn't help his hate me for me. Your, your approach to racing was even then different. It will be considered really different now when the first thing you've got to do is thank call your sponsors and be PR savvy and pretend if not it is the truth that you train every day and you go cycling with professional cyclists and all the rest of it, you, to me, just seemed to be able to ride a bike very fast and that's what you enjoyed doing. You didn't dwell too much if it went wrong. The winning for you seemed to be more important than most other things. Is that, and for me, I'll be honest, that's what made you popular. <laughs> And yeah, absolutely. The only reason I ever did anything that looked like training was because Rob Mack said I should. Uh, you know, and then McK having Mackenzie for a team, come on, let's go for a run. I'm like, really? You know, we have to race this weekend. We need to rest. Um, but yeah, I I, um, I probably train a lot more now than I did when I was racing. And you know, I never felt like I was tired at the end of a race. Uh, you know, some of those races, the last lap, I might be having to pick the bike, but pick the bike up out of the gravel, which I didn't really feel tired doing that either. So, um, you know, I, I had four years old. I first rode a motorcycle, a mini bike. So, um, and I feel like I just kind of grew up on a bike, and uh, training wasn't something that that I enjoyed. I always enjoyed riding motorcycles, but I wasn't going to do anything extra, like go to the gym and run and cycle and all that. I, I found cycling about 91, 92, and I think it probably really did help my career. Um, you know, whether it helps you stay focused is because you're not hanging on for dear life those last couple laps, but I thought that if you rode a 500 at, at, at the top, that everybody was hanging on for dear life at the end, no matter how, how fit you were, so. Um, you know, and first, anything, first thing I ever did internationally was here in England, and uh, you know, the team was based here, so. Especially the British Grand Prix at, uh, at Donington Park was always a, a special place for me because I really wasn't any good at my home Grand Prix, so I had to try, try and be good at somebody's home Grand Prix. And to be able to watch uh, the team and their family and all their friends celebrate uh, really meant a lot to me. So. Yeah, you liked Donington, didn't you? I did. I, I, I liked it from the first time we went. Even in the wet, I thought it was great. And it was wet quite a lot. It was wet, but there was one time it wasn't wet. There was ice everywhere. It was piled against the had a wall, but uh, you know the weather here, just like just like it is in Texas. You don't like it, just wait a couple minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you bike. You were a Suzuki man through and through. Never re rode anything else throughout your your own racing career. At least either it was a, a four-stroke Suzuki or uh, a two-stroke 500 Suzuki. Did you feel you had a disadvantage, machinery-wise? At the time, it was accepted. So you were on a bike that was more difficult to ride, flick the bitch, all that kind of thing, and it was because you were trying that hard, you were falling off a bit. People saw the bike as probably the most difficult bike to ride that you wouldn't choose if you got the choice. Well, I, I guess I really didn't have a choice at the time. Um, you know, there was that was about all there was out there. And two different times in my career, I tried to get on something different, and neither time did uh, did it actually happen. So, um, you know, I think the Suzuki was a was a great bike in '89. It had a, a kid on top of it that all I knew how to do was as much friggin' right hand as possible. Twist it, twist it, twist it, go as fast as I can, as long as I can, and uh, it had some mechanical issues. I crashed it three times out of a race, and it broke three times out of a race, and we were, I think, a 15 Grand Prix season. We sat on pole 12 times. We led most of them. Uh, you know, it was just a, a, a young rookie, uh, rookie bunch of rookie mistakes that I made, but uh, that bike in 93 was, I think, uh, the best motorcycle out there. You know, it wasn't wasn't the match for a Honda on speed. 
and it probably wasn't a match for Yamaha as far as consistency uh, and handling and getting around almost every racetrack really good. Uh, but it was great a lot of places and it was decent most of the rest. And uh, as a rider, I felt like that nobody had the perfect machine. Uh, you know, we all had little issues with all of them. And, uh, you know, if I could find a way to compensate for whatever inadequacies my motorcycle might have had, then I was, uh, I was a better rider and a better guy than everybody else out there. I'm just going to ask you if you felt that. Because this, this is in a time, I don't know what you feel, but certainly for me, I guess you look back at your own era of watching and being involved in a sport as the best of that sport, the best era. For me, it was the big V4 two-stroke 500s. For me, it was the most exciting era of it all, both machine-wise and rider-wise. And in an era that you had people like Doohan and Lawson and Gardner riding bikes that even if they did do what you wanted, you got hurt a lot, all of you. There wasn't any time when everybody in the paddock was fit. You went to a 500 GP paddock at that time, and at least two or three of them guys, the top lads, were limping or sawing a pot off, or Dr. Costa was working on to get him fit to ride. But you were accepted as the fastest man, if not the most successful. You were definitely the fastest man on a, on a sort of week by week basis. Did you feel that? You know, I, I, I don't think I ever really thought about it that much. I always just kind of judged my performance off my teammate. And, you know, there weren't a lot of times that I had teammates that really pushed me. Um, but when there were, it was, it was something that I took notice of. So, you know, I, I was, and I think that's why I was as good as I was and as successful as I was, is I was racing a motorcycle, making a living. You know, that's all that really mattered to me. I was getting to travel the world and meet all kinds of great people. Uh, I was, uh, every, every minute of every day that I raced that Grand Prix bike, I was having fun. And it seems like there's a lot of the people out there that race these days that it's, it's, enjoy. it's a job, you yeah. know. It's either this or go to the office, uh, you know, and this much more beats the office. So, um, yeah, when I, when I talk to a kid who's up and coming and wants to, you know, aspires to be a, a, a racer, I, the first thing they've got to have is a huge heart because you got to want to do it. I mean. Yeah, every day is not going to be perfect like it is outside right now. There's going to be bad days, there's going to be good days, there's going to be injuries. There's so many things that come along with the job that you, you've got to be able to just will yourself through it a lot of times. And uh, man, if you're not having fun doing all that, uh, there's a lot of other jobs out there, a lot less rest that you ought to be, you know, ought to be doing. Of all those, those guys you race with, do you rate as... You, I mean, the obvious answer would be Rainey, you had the biggest rival with him going right through your career. But who was the most talented, you think? Who, who, was, who did you fear the most or respect the most, let's say? Well, uh, probably Wayne across the board, uh, Wayne Rainey. Um, you know, besides him, there was there was Gardner, there was Dunn, there was McGee, there was Beatty, there was, uh, I mean, all of them. There was McElnay, there was McKenzie. Um, who did I fear the most? Well, when he got mad, Rob Mack. Um, <laughs> only, only as his teammate and then after, after being his teammate. You don't want to rub that guy the wrong way because he is big. Tell, um, tell, uh, there's a story that I know a little bit about from Rob's side of it. Something happened, I think you were going spectating at, at Daytona when you were both teammates. You went spectating, not, neither you rode the Daytona that evening. You went to watch or promote or whatever. You were there for Suzuki and uh, there was an incident. <laughs> Yeah, in the hotel room? Yep. Yeah, he almost, I think he had me by my ankles, <laughs> hanging on the 13th floor balcony, said, I'm going to drop if you don't stop it. Um, yeah, I think, actually, he was maybe managing the team, okay. and, and he thought he needed some sleep, and I was in the room giving him a hard time, and like I said, rubbing the wrong way. <laughs> He's a big lot, isn't he? He is. He grabbed me, flipped me over, had me by my ankles, and I think was about to just, and he, he thought he could la land me in the swimming pool, so... I remember a little bit about those days, and do you think you had more fun? I mean, I know you raced hard, it was, I think, more dangerous, so it took more heart and more commitment, I think, than it does now, in my opinion. Um, but on a Sunday night, you definitely, 100%, knew how to let your hair down more than they do now, or more than maybe they're allowed to do now. You were allowed to be characters then, and they're not now. Yeah, well, I think the reason they're not is because of the way we used to let our hair down. Um, you know, there was there's stories about Jerez where Honda's upstairs having a celebration dinner, and Yamaha and Suzuki team decide we're going to start 
throwing drinks up through the upstairs window and really, really disrupting their dinner. Uh, next thing you know, it's trash cans full of wine and you know stuff getting thrown, food getting thrown everywhere. And Monday or Tuesday or whenever they finally found out who all the culprits were, we all got reprimanded and were told, don't do that again. Team managers were fired or moved to a different position. But yeah, it's, um, like I explained earlier, it's a, it's a job that's, there's a lot of pressure, there's, a, there's a, a lot of good and a lot of bad that can happen. But, uh, you know, when the race is over, it's time to have fun. And, you know, if, it, uh, if Randy and I had a race where we were really close and we wanted to fight in the after-race press conference, typically Sunday night, you could find us in the same bar, uh, maybe with a little animosity, but uh, at least talking to each other and talking about how I was going to kick his ass the next weekend again, and he, or he was going to try and kick mine. So it was all fun and games, that's for sure. Do you think you should have won more championships? You won one world championship, but yet you were the, in terms of Grand Prix wins, you were the second best American ever in 500. That's 25 wins or 26, I think. 25. And, and do you think that should have translated into more? Because typically, if you've just seen that you've won 25, you think, well, that's four or five championships. You know, I, I think. <laughs> I think we had the machine two different years to win the championship, and that was 89 and that was 93. Uh, in 89, uh, I wasn't experienced enough. Had I not made the mistakes, the mechanicals, I think, still would have cost us the championship. Had um, we not had mechanicals and I crashed, we still wouldn't have won the championship. So it would have needed to be a better team effort all around, and I think in 93 was the only other opportunity that we really had with a bike that was consistent enough everywhere we went to be able to win the championship. And, you know, we um, we did our best from the start of the season all the way through Donington to build up a 23-point lead until uh, that that bowling pin McDoing decided to try and make a lucky strike out of it. Is that what Still he did? Still got a picture, yeah, got it, got it the S is there. Yeah, um, so, yeah, and we were fortunate enough to end up winning that championship anyway. But, uh, you know, that had I ridden a Yamaha or had I ridden a Honda, Maybe I'd have never, never come to grips with it. Who knows? But, uh, you know, Suzuki developed the bike around me, and maybe that's why none of my teammates ever did any better than they did, was whatever it was that I developed, it was a real animal to ride, and it didn't do anything right. And, uh, you know, maybe I, I really don't know that much about development of a motorcycle, but it did what I wanted it to, and it helped me win 25 Grand Prix. So I think it was a, a successful bike. Um, and, yeah, I think we did with it the best we could just about every year. Two moves I remember from that time. Number one is dropping it across the front of Wayne at Melbourne Loop. Coming from about 30 yards behind, I think last lap, maybe next to last lap. It went quite last Right. And winning it. Um, and a move that you'd have. Yeah, no, I, I wondered about that as well. <laughs> Not on your own. She, she has no pants on, that's on her jeans. <laughs> I just start pointing that out. Um, that was one of them. And I've got to be honest, unless you've raced a bike, it's pretty difficult to understand how difficult that is to do against somebody who's rubbish on a bike. Never mind somebody of, of the caliber of Wayne. The second one is uh, Okanang. I've never seen anything like that. You went skittling into the stadium uh, section. For me, out of control. Oh, me too. It's a top one, but I'm there. <laughs> it, was, it was out of control. I was talking to Martin Ogborn the other day, and he was he asked me about it at, uh, at dinner at Huntington on Saturday night. And the, the Hockenheim move was, I passed Wayne coming off the long right-hander. I got a really good drive, and I think he didn't want to lead coming out of the chicane, so I think he may have got off the gas a little early, let me have the spot. I hustled into the chicane probably a little quicker than I should have and then didn't get the drive out that I did. And as I thought about it, I'm like, so we're coming up down the straightaway, we're going into the stadium, it's a right-hander. So I'm gonna stay all the way pinned to the right side of the racetrack. Because I think if he comes around me, he's gonna to wanna to come in around me on the right, and he's gonna to wanna to, want to kind of block and keep me from getting back inside of him. Because if I'm inside of him, he's gonna lose that battle every time. And as he came back across, from the far right side of the racetrack going into a corner that is a right where you want to be on the left side, 
I think as he came around me and started back across, I think it kind of disrupted where, maybe where his brake marker was that he was getting to. There was a bridge there at the time that I think we used the shadow of, or at least a little bit before, a little bit after that. And um, so when he comes by me, he has to pull back across the front. Well, as he does, that helps me because it puts me right in his draft. So I get in his draft and I'm thinking, man, I'm not losing much ground to him. This is really good. And then all of a sudden I see the back of the Yamaha go, oh, and the back end stand up. And I thought, mm -hmm. I haven't even thought about touching the brakes yet. I'm about to run right into the back of him. So the first thing I do is, in this big exaggerated move, oh, try and get off the right side of the bike to not hit him. And then I realize, probably ought to start trying to slow this thing down. Well, it's, it's probably sitting across the racetrack at somewhat of an angle like this if we're going straight. It's not going straight. And so as I grab the front brakes, it just wants to tie itself in knots. And I think I know a lot about bike control and clutch and a little bit of brake, a little bit of downshift and off and on. And I can sort this thing out and it's not sorting itself out. And I'm looking, thinking, well, what I really don't want to do is take him out. Maybe I did really in the back of my mind. I wouldn't have minded that, but I thought I'd really feel like a bad guy if I'd done that. So I all the way down to the apex of the corner and finally it kind of sorts itself out. I get into the corner and I think, hmm, I still don't see that Yamaha, so I must be in okay position. I grab a handful of right throttle, a handful of throttle with my right hand, and the bike goes nowhere. And I thought, what's wrong? And I look at the tack. Well, it's a second gear corner, but in the everything trying to get it stopped and in control, I'd gone back to first gear. So when I do this and go back to the gas, it won't move because it's well past maximum revs. We're lucky the crankshaft didn't break because they'd break at that time. And I go to second gear, and it's just as I go, you guys all notice that I go, I shift up for second gear? Anybody that rides a Grand Prix bike will tell you that's wrong, I think. But anyway, so I go to second gear, and I think, huh, oh, he's probably coming around me about Mach 2 right now. And I look over, and in that video, you can see me look over, and everybody's like, I mean, you, you just made a pass on him like that, and now you're going to look over and antagonize him? I wasn't antagonizing, I was curious as to where he was. So uh, he wasn't, wasn't coming around me. He had gotten up kind of close to the outside and almost to my rear tire, but then into the Saks curve, he probably made one of his best braking moves ever, which kept him the same distance from me. I didn't, he didn't lose a lot of ground to me getting in. And you know, but at that point, it was just be defensive. And all the way around to the right-hander, managed to just keep him behind me, because if, if the finish line had been another 50 yards or so, 50 meters down the road, uh, he was just starting to come back around me, but we won that one. Yeah, I, when I, I remember watching that, and the look back to see where he was, I can guarantee 100% of the people who watched it, that was, in my head, you look back and went, <laughs> <laughs> that's what he did. He just looked like, he just looked such a nonchalant look back at, in the corner, that I actually know the corner, and it's, when you come, it's all slipstreaming, at uh, oh, the old look, it's gone now, it's all been chopped up the circuit, but you come off a long, long straight, big right-hander, if you lead out of that right-hander into the infield, you, you'd struggle not to win unless you were unless you made a big mistake. So, to me, that was, you know you won it, you went. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it was even funnier because it was two weeks later in Assen that I saw Wayne Rainey make one of the rarest mistakes he's ever made, and that was run off in the last chicane and, and give me the race. Um, and in the press conference, he was so, so mad at himself about doing it. We sit down, of course, what does the first journalist grab the microphone and ask? Hey, Wayne, what happened? <laughs> and I saw the microphone sitting on the table and I could tell Wayne was really kind of thinking about what to say and I grabbed the mic and went, that all came from a couple of weeks ago in Germany. <laughs> Ooh, man, you should have seen me. That's the closest we've ever come to, to, to to, to, to blows, but uh, you know we, we managed to restrain. And funny enough, uh, I think sitting underneath his, uh, sitting at his motorhome that evening, having having a few drinks, and uh, somebody decided there was some fireworks involved. So we went over, set off some fireworks, and one had a really quick fuse, and I threw it up like that, and it went over and landed on his canopy and blew a big hole in it. <laughs> so I had to bring a canopy back next time I came back from America <laughs> to, for him to replace. So yeah. Lots of good stories. And we've got a question for Kevin. Do you have a much chance we've got 
Doing it in the middle there. We've got, we're making roster over at work now. Most satisfying Grand Prix for me? Yeah. 1991 Japanese. And that was, that was because Wayne was one of the guys that I beat, but in that particular race, I think, for a while, Lawson was there, Gardner was there, Doon was there, Rainey was there. Um, two or three Japanese wild cards were there. And it was, I mean, it, and it was a, the year that, in 91, Michelin only supplied the factory Honda with tires. So we had to go from using Michelins like we'd done all our career. In 91, we actually had to run Dunlops, which, ironically enough, I won just as many Grand Prix in 91 as I had in 90, 90 or I didn't win but one in 92. So. Um, so the tires, the tires were good, but it was in testing and practice and qualifying and everything, we stunk. I mean, we were nowhere even close to being the fastest guy in that race. And we'd gone, we started at the front, we slid kind of to the back of that main group, and then as everybody's tires started to go off, we just kind of started working our way back through slowly, 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 and it wasn't until right at the end, and I don't think it was a big move getting into the chicane the last lap that actually won it for me. I think I actually kind of cleared off the last lap and managed to beat everybody somewhat handily. But, uh, you know, the fact that everybody was there, those battles of uh, me beating Wayne, uh, I mean, every one of them was pretty special. But, uh, you know, when everybody was involved, it was uh, it was definitely the one that I call my best Grand Prix. What year was it at uh, one of the Suzuka ones, uh, which is a place you always did really well at? Um, it was the closest ever found a GP finish at that point, like about, I think about half a second before he involved in it. And that was the chicane last lap job, I think, when you won it. It might have been 94. Uh, it was me and Beatty and... Hmm. No. It was 93. Because Wayne won that year. He missed a shift getting to the line, which let me be really close. I had passed Beatty and Ito. Not the uh, chicane. Uh, yeah, those two rockets of Hondas. Um, I got them in the chicane the last lap, and uh, yeah, it was it was a pretty tight finish. But you know, the best one was what's your best Grand Prix? Favorite ones, first one and last one, uh, Japanese, and then my last Grand Prix win was here at Donington, and I felt like I did that one one-handed, this this hand in a cast most of that season, and uh, you know, like I said, Donington was one of those places it was always really special to us. But uh, yeah, I could tell you a little bit about every every one of the 25. I don't really remember much about the ones I didn't win. That's funny. You want to wake at the end of some of them. Yeah. Good. Good point. <laughs> Good question for Kevin. What's, what's your worst off? Worst crash. Mm. question is worst crash. Worst crash is the one that really wasn't my fault. Uh, that would be Lawson running into the back of me at the first turn at Aston. Dislocated hip, broken arm. Um, I dislocated the hip another time after that, but uh, you know, it was 92 wasn't a great year for us. We didn't have a very good bike. Um, myself and Doug Chandler did all we could all year long to try and to try and get it better. And in Magello, we managed to win. And in Assen, Rainey had gone home. He was hurt. Doon was really hurt. And Gardner didn't remember what his name or his wife's name or anybody else's name. Well, I was the only guy there in a shot, within a shot at the championship. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I think Mick had won the first five rounds. We beat him at Mugello. And then there was a couple of races and then we went to Assen. So that one, and that one hurts the most because that was the, I remember my hip being like the worst pain I'd ever experienced. That first of all, and second of all, the fact that it, it happened to it happened with a guy that I really thought was a, a, a friend of mine up until that point, um, you know. And then he gets up and walks away and says, "Well, you're lucky you're hurt." He didn't say it to me because I'd have got up off the stretcher if he'd have said it to me. But he said it when it, when he got back to the paddock, and there was some journalist mentioned it to me later. But um, you know, I would have thought I always raced Eddie in, in with the respect of 87, 88, 89. He's leading the championship. Do I want to be the guy that decides this championship? No, I'm going to race him as clean as I can. And you know what, if I get a good shot to get by him, I will. If I don't have a good shot, I'll just stay where I'm at. But I'm not going to risk knocking him down. And sure. I lost a lot of respect for him. Good question. I've got my favorite circuit. We've raced pretty much all the circuits. A lot of them are disappearing now. Like we've said, they don't go on Mons anymore. Uh, places like uh, Zellweg have all been chopped up. There's Ockenheim's been castrated basically the, the long fast bit's gone 
Salzburg or Spa. You know, I like those places just because they're scary places. So <laughs> super fast and so super scary. And you know, we only raced them for a few years until like '91 or '92. Um, I think I liked them more because a lot of the other guys didn't. You know, it's kind of like the rain. Everybody's like, "Oh shit, it's raining. We got to go." I was like, Man, "That's the almighty equalizer." You know, my bike's not fast enough. We're competitive in the wet, especially early on. Um, as far as tracks uh, that I really like the layout of and that I had a lot of success at, it's either Suzuka or Donington. Uh, would be the, my two favorite places to race for sure. You raced in an era when the bikes were um, perceived as being almost impossible to ride unless you were sort of superhuman. Uh, and sure enough, you, the people at the limit did crash them a lot. How difficult were they to ride near the limit? Did you feel safe on them at any point when things were going? Well, I'm guessing you did. You know, when the, when the bike was set up, when I say it's close to 100%, I don't think I ever rode a bike that was 100% perfect. But when I rode that bike that was at least 95%, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like things happen in slow motion, and you're thinking, wow, you go out for warm-up, old tires, full tank of fuel, and you're breaking the, you know, running right at what you qualified at, thinking, oh, man, this is going to be a good day. You pull in, you tell the guys, don't do anything to that motorcycle. Don't you put gas in it and put some new tires on it, but don't, don't touch anything. The only problem with that is of the hundred and I think almost ten Grand Prix that I rode, I can count those bikes on one hand. So it, it's, it's always, you know, there are three of them I think, maybe four. Um, but it's it's one of those things that nobody's ever got a bike that's perfect, and it's who can ride it the best, and who can compensate for the for the lack of setup or the problems that we're having with pushing the front or the lack of grip and the drive grip and the rear. Now. You run into that problem the guy says well you know we just didn't have the right map for that so there isn't a whole lot the rider can do these days at least back in 80s and 90s up until at least late 90s before electronics became such a big part of it um, you know it, it really was down to the rider and you know i think you hear riders talk about we as a team we as a team we as a team whereas you know back in the day we were all i i i you know i won this race i did Actually, they had, the bike had to be set up by the team, but um, you know, I really felt like it was it was me against the other guy. And um, you, you know, feel privileged because of that? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. You know, to have just gotten back from the Suzuki eight hour and having to ride something there, having to ride, getting the getting the opportunity to ride something there that's electronic as it is. Um, you know, it it's kind of hard to really appreciate. A fast lap. You know, you watch um, one of my teammates on the Yosh bike do a 206.7. You think, wow, that's three seconds faster than I've ever been around this place. How do you do that? You just got to have that much more confidence and that much more faith in the electronics. And what I found hard riding a bike that's so electronic is you, you, you spend so much time on old tires that when you do finally get a new set of tires, you're so used to altering your line to try and get around people to do things when you got a clean lap when you're the only one on the track, you almost don't remember what the perfect line around the place is. And uh, you know, the electronics help you get away with that a little bit more. You don't have to be as consistent and so spot on every corner, uh, everything exactly perfect every lap. So yeah, it's uh, it was a, it was an honor to uh, to have raced all the guys that, that I got to race uh, to ride at some of the tracks that no longer uh, that no longer are on the GP schedule and. Um, every last minute of it, like I said before, was a ton of fun. What do you think to the, the modern uh, MotoGP era? Uh, for me, the thing I can't get here on is uh, split classes, there's different rules for whatever sort of system you go into, and it's all a little bit difficult, even for somebody who's involved in it, to understand it fully. And I don't think I understand it fully. Um, you know, the, the difference in classes in MotoGP. You know, the Moto2, Moto3, I think I understand that a little bit. And that's some of the best racing there is out there right now. And credit to MotoGP, it probably wouldn't be quite so boring if there wasn't somebody named Marquez in it. But, you know, we get that every now and then. And I think instead of looking at it as boring racing, we got to look at it as, wow, you know, he really is good. Uh, the bike's good, the team's good, the rider's good. Uh, he's riding with so much confidence right now. He plays with him for about, head till about half distance. And then he says... Okay, gotta go. See ya. <laughs> For me, yeah, that, that's. I mean, he's he's making it boring by being as good as he is. However, you know, CRT that kind of came and then went, and then 
that it's just it's in a complete state of flux for me that you, you're almost bound to look back to the days when you had one two five 250, 500s, you knew the set of rules, you knew exactly what everybody had to deal with, and so you can understand what you're watching. Yeah, they should put carburetors back on them and take all the electronics away. Uh, find a tire manufacturer that can build a tire to, to make to make the race, and just let them go. You know, I, I think the riders will figure out how to ride the bikes. They'll be figure out how to control them. Um, 230, 240 horsepower, whatever they've got now, however many, however much torque they got, you know, it, it's a much forgiving, much more forgiving motorcycle to ride now, especially with the electronics. But if they could take the electronics off, and uh, you know, just let the riders come back and, and, and be the deciding factor in what wins the race, I, I think Marquez is winning because he is the best rider. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it would be a better show. Uh, I think you'd have six or eight guys scrapping at the front. I think some young kids would be up there. I think some of the veterans would be up there. And you know, right now it's. It's anything but that. Agreed. Another question from the floor. Did Suzuki let you keep any bikes you raced up? Some of the ones that I didn't didn't bend up and break, yeah. <laughs> um, no, the only one that I have any, any real significance is my 93 championship bike. Uh, and so I have to say thanks to Suzuki because they took the bike back at the end of the year. I say thanks, okay, I'm not going to say thanks. Um, they took it back at the end of the year, and they rebuilt the engine. And they put the gearbox in it and the settings, exact settings. We ran some different size brake rotors, some different width rims, some, of course transmission was different every race. Uh, suspension, did everything as it was the last Grand Prix I won in 1993, which was the Dutch TT. Uh, but they also took the opportunity to take the little, so it did have one little electronic device in it that could detune it. And when I got it home, I tried to get it running, and it was like, like it had a dead exhaust valve battery. Uh, anyway, I talked to one of the engineers. He said, no, 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 they just put a, put a chip in it so that it won't make full power. He says, but guess what I got? <laughs> so I actually have my 93 bike with full power. So, um, yeah, and it's got a special place in the house that I'm remodeling that's hopefully going to be closer to being done when I get home. Do you ride it or do you rely on, I mean, there is Kevin Schwantz bikes out there. What were you riding at the weekend at night? Steve Wheatman owns uh, quite a collection of RGVs, and it was one of his bikes. It's a 94, uh, a 94 vintage bike. Whether it's actually one of mine or one of Barrels's, I'm not sure. I bet you got 34 on it. Yeah, it did have the right number on it. <laughs> Do you get to write your own, or is that just a... Mine has been written once, I think, in 07 at Indianapolis, uh, when the f first time they ran into Indianapolis for a MotoGP race. Uh, one of the guys who worked on our team, Hamish Jamison, came over and spent yeah, probably a month or so getting the bike up and running. It had some things that needed to be repaired and rebuilt on it from uh, when we tried to get it running. There had a little bit of water damage in some of the mag cases. Yeah, a lot of mag diesel, isn't it? Which yeah. doesn't age well. It doesn't. And uh, Steve Wheatman yesterday, when I went to ride in the wet, he goes, Okay, it's okay right now, but if it ever starts raining, get in because we don't want this thing getting wet. Yeah, the magnesium uh, corrodes like mad with the, uh, obviously it's for lightness, but it corrodes like mad with any kind of moisture. If you leave, uh, and RGVs and RGs were always built with a lot of my crankcases, etc. People ran them, I did a parade lap, and if they don't get to them and dry everything out, and I mean properly dry it out, even just a little drop in the water pump, it just burns its way through, it completely destroys them. So. The, the one play, one example is that where, where the water pump pushes the water up, the little elbow that sits there, if you don't pull the actual metal piece off and drain everything out of the water pump, that whole piece on the bottom is just completely corroded. Yeah. You just pull the hose off, well, it leaves, leaves water right up to the top of that. So, yeah, there's a lot uh, a lot of damage that can happen with just water. Are you, when, you, when you get on one of your old bikes that's still running properly now, but the bike that you rode at the weekend, I saw, I was instructing on the Suzuki track day at Silverstone last week, and I actually saw uh, one of Wheatman's mechanics running it in. Just, he just said, look, I want to fuel up, so make sure when we give you Kevin, it's actually going to work properly. And it looked really sharp. You can tell with the two-stroke, generally, how the, the exhaust is coming out and how it sounds. And it sounded sharp. Does it surprise you how still quick they are? Because this... The, Quick things. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's and the one time I got to ride my bike in America was ride, I rode it at Barber where we had a, a riding school, and I'd been around Barber on MD 250s and I've been around Barber on 600s and thousands. And, um, unbelievable how by how, how 
a race bike of that era, how well it goes over hills, how well it handles, how stiff it is, uh, and how comfortable you, you, you can get on them really quickly. And at Donington the other day, um, and I, I, I joked around with the guys when I got in, I said, this thing must remember how to get around this place because it, it almost did it on its own. Um, you know, up under where the bridge used to be, where it's no longer, um, where I went out through the grass a couple times when I was here for the match races. Black lines there, coppice down the back straightaway. It's running sharp enough that even when you go under where the Dunlop Bridge used to be, it still wants to wheel it. Not quite out of control like it used to, but uh, it, it's pretty close. It's probably not dead set on the jetting, but... Um, so what you're talking about with that 94 bike, 170 brake? Yeah, probably 160. I'm weighing 135 kilos. 130, yeah. See, that's still power to weight more than a super bike is now at 200 horsepower. And, and then in the beginning, in 90, they changed the weight to 130 kilos. When we first rode them in 88, 80, well, I guess 86, 87, 88, 89, uh, only 115 kilos. So if you had one that was 130 or 140 horsepower back then, it only weighed 115 kilos. It was... Um, a rascal. It was <laughs> yeah, not real forgiving. <laughs> the question. The most cycle news you rode the new Suzuki. The most cycle news you rode the new Suzuki. The, the team's bringing out next year. What, did, what was your opinion on that? You know, I haven't ridden a MotoGP bike in so long that I really don't know what one's supposed to be like. But I had been riding an American Superbike uh, at the track in Austin, Dakota, um, for half a day up to that point. Twice the bike of a, you know, what just a standard AMA Superbike is. But um, I guess the scary part about it is, went within. Well, I actually went faster on that in ten laps than I went in two days on my superbike. Um, you know, and I worked pretty hard at it on my superbike. But um, you know, the scary part is, is looking at pictures. Um, every photo I see, the front wheel's about six, eight, ten inches in the air. I don't ever remember wheeling. You know, it's that electronic these days. It's got so many controls on it: spin, wheelie, everything that you come off the corner and you go grab a handful of throttle and it goes and it comes out and you think, oh, that wasn't bad. You see a photo and it's this high in the air, which I think gives you the opportunity to, yeah, I guess maybe if you rub one all the time, you get, you get to understand that. But, uh, you know, my fear with that is you come off a corner and if you're not just going down a big long straightaway and then at the end you get to let the thing sit on the front and then grab the brakes, try and make a quick transition from on the gas to on the brakes, you might grab a handful of brake while the front wheel's still in the air. Um, I think that scenario when that sets down is uh, is catastrophic at best. So, um, fun bike to ride. Only thing I could do with it was put it in the wrong part of the racetrack. Otherwise, it was uh, you know it was really really user friendly. I thought, which I'm not sure that's what a bike needs to be to be a good race bike. Do you do you have any problem riding it the way that you meant to ride it now, like the electronic sort it out, or does that go against everything? Because if you didn't that with your bikes back in the day, you'd have been injured. Yeah, every, every time it's Suzuka, that, you know, last year when I rode, this year when I rode, uh, you know, it's, it's that right hand that knows when you get up into a corner and the bike starts moving, that you really better not do much more with that right hand, because that means hurt. Yeah. <laughs> that means we're going to be probably be okay. And with the electronics, you can get in into a corner, and I'll use the, the Dunlop curve at, uh, at Suzuka as an example drive off in that corner following somebody in front of me that I know has been really fast around Suzuka. We get in and we get up the hill, it flattens out, and my bike starts moving a little bit. <laughs> well, that's all I can do. It's moving. You know, it's moving the back enough that it's moving the front a little bit, and I can't go any faster than that. Whereas if you just go ahead and get past that, let the computer take over, it actually sorts itself out, sticks itself back down in the back a little bit better, makes the front turn, doesn't keep the bike unbalanced. Uh, it does everything it's supposed to, but Absolutely. The hardest thing that I've ever had to do in my entire life is make that right hand move past that point where this is going to mean I get to go to the moon. <laughs> I say it, a casualty immediately. Uh, another question for Gary. Thank you. Hang on, wait to get the mic, then we can all hear you. Uh, could you tell us the funniest high car story, please? I witnessed a couple of them, I'll tell mine in a minute. You know, I, I, I don't have any good ones for me, but um, you know, that probably the funniest one that I heard about, and I forget where I was, maybe I was still at the hotel. Yeah, we were at Donington testing, and of course, um, Gary Taylor used to always 
get some Daily Mirror sponsorship or whatever magazine or newspaper it was. And so a bunch of the journalists had come out and they wanted to watch us test. Well, it was raining, so we weren't going to do any testing. Well, somebody comes up with a great idea. Put them in the red car. Let Barrows take them around. <laughs> Second lap, old hairpin, it's on its roof. <laughs> um, yeah, that's... <laughs> well, God, I remember, no, and everybody had their seatbelts on. That's, that's pretty ironic, too. I don't know what, I don't know what year, but you were involved. <laughs> I, every year at the British Grand Prix, um, there was, they used to have a super bike support race, but the two-stroke guys, which all GPs were two-strokes every class at the time, were really scared of the four-stroke boys going out before the full GP uh, schedule had, had occurred because they figured they were going to dump a lot of oil, which we did occasionally. So we got to, we practiced a little bit of Friday, nothing on Saturday, and then we went out at six o'clock on, on Sunday night when the GP boys had finished. And it was just, really, we only entered that race to get the free tickets to get in and watch the Grand Prix, to be honest. <laughs> but we raced. And then because I knew Kevin a little bit from Macau and we got invited to a big drink up at one of the motorhomes, don't know who's, and then somebody at about midnight, everybody's drunk, decided to get the eye cars out. And uh, only the problem for me is it was my own car, wasn't I? Okay. <laughs> so I'm in my own, I'm in my own car and I, but I, I didn't want to lose out, so I wanted to get involved and somebody decided that one of the garages he could pull the door off and get through the garages onto the track, down the pit lane. And I don't know how, but I got, I ended up through first in my own car. Went, I know we went down Donington, obviously, I went rattling down pit lane. Uh, there's none of the circuit lights on, but I've got my car lights on. I never knew they put a chain across the bottom of the pit lane. <laughs> <laughs> flipping it in the front of my car, scooped over, scratched every single panel, including the roof. And because everybody thought it was an eye car, it's dead funny. And I thought, I'm going to have to fucking pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind, of, I kind of sculled off with my tail between my legs, figuring I've got to fix his car, but it was still going off. And then the police came, and the police came with a, a, um, a motorway, sort of uh, jam sandwich type uh, police car, figured what was going on, got a couple of the, the guys, and the last I saw of the whole incident, I'm kind of sculling off, trying to just disappear, knowing it's costing me a fortune. And there was Wayne Rainey in the back of the police car, drunk, having left his eye car on the circuit somewhere. And he's leaning forward through the gap between the two policemen that were sat there trying to get some information about what had happened and who were doing what. And he's pulling in the gear lever going, let's go, let's go. <laughs> and I thought, I cannot afford to hang about with these idiots. <laughs> and I went home. Yeah, well, the, the funnier part of that story was it turned into lap times. I think we got one car out on the track. Um, so we decided we'll stand at start finish and start checking lap times. And I did a lap, Wayne did a lap, I think Bubba Schobert might have been there, I forget who else, Mackenzie was there, I uh, know Mackenzie was there because I think he's the end of the story. And um, Rob Mack, and so we're all pretty close on lap times and Rob Mack gets in the car and hmm. he's got some local knowledge, he may be the tough one to beat. And so we're standing out from the boxes because there's no place to sit, stand safely on the track, so we stand out in the grass. Well, of course, Rob Mack comes down the back straightaway under Dunlop Bridge, and what does he do? He just checks right, doesn't he? He knows, hey, stay matted, keep the thing flat out, and I'll come blasting through this. What he didn't realize was that he was going to drift across the track and out into the grass, and the five or six of us that were there watching had to <laughs> dive for our lives to not be... We could have all gotten killed that instant by Rob Mack. Anyway, he comes back around, McKenzie gets in it, and McKenzie tries to do the same thing. And what, Rob, what, what Neil McKenzie didn't realize, I guess, that Rob Mack did was how long the tire barrier was. And when Neil thought, well, I've got to trim it a bit tighter than Rob, because I've seen what happens if you do it wrong, you end up in the grass. So he trimmed it a bit tighter, and when we didn't see him for a while, we went looking, and he was actually stuck, had the hire car stuck on top of the stack of tires, we couldn't get it off. So that was, I think, when we called it a night, or maybe that's when the police showed up at the same time, I'm not sure. Yeah, I couldn't afford all that. Okay. Another question. You just stick up your hand, and I'll uh, I'll try and find you with this microphone. So, anybody got a question? That's Kevin. If not, I've got some money. Speak up. You got to, you got to let everybody know the question. Well, I signed her boyfriend's tank. Oh, of course. I wonder who he is. <laughs> um. 
Right. How much riding do you do now? I know you run a you run a school. School's on uh, school's on hiatus right now. We've we've given all our Hondas and Suzuki's back, and uh, you know the past 12 months have been focused towards going to Suzuka and competing in the eight hour. Unfortunately, my teammate crashed early on, and I never got to ride the bike in the race. But um, you know, everybody said, "Well, that just means you'll come back next year." Well, my mindset going this year was that I wasn't ever going to do it because I did just turn 50 this year. So. Right now, my mind says no, but the more I think about it, the more opportunity that I get, and the more we talk about it, um, you know, who knows, Suzuka's maybe still on the calendar for next year, but uh, the school was, uh, we started it in 01, we ran it until last year, and without any manufacturer support in the industry in America, I think they said took a 40% hit. If you want to just hear basic numbers and not percentages, Suzuki used to sell 60,000 GSXRs a year in the United States. To date, they barely sell 20. So they're nowhere back to where they need to be um, as far as numbers go. And I think until they get back closer to those numbers, the support for training programs and schools and stuff like mine probably isn't gonna exist, but I still have the ability, still have the capability, have the knowledge, have the curriculum, have leathers, have helmets, boots, gloves. I can, uh, if somebody comes to Texas and wants to go ride and we can, uh, we can find motorcycles and take you riding, that's for sure. Rob Mike used to tell me a story about he went riding with you and you'd take him down, I think, uh, yeah, I think actually with Jim as well. I think it was some of your old buddies and you'll all go riding down to Baja and you stopped at the same places, you knew people on route that you could bunk up with and all the rest of it. And he said that you might have been on a, well, you'd borrowed him, a, he, he reckoned you'd borrowed him a substandard bike so he couldn't keep up and then his gearbox seized and you had to free off with a rock and all that, what I'm talking yeah, well, he's the old middle. But he always thought that even when we were teammates, he had a less bike than me. Um, he was yeah, 15 we, stone, I yeah, mean, that's that, the that, that was the only thing, yeah, there, there definitely wasn't less of him than there was of me. But, uh, yeah, we all, we invited him to come to Baja, California. We used to go down, me and my dad and a bunch of his buddies, we used to go down, ride four or five days down, and come back four or five days, had places to stop, <laughs> places to stay. The, uh, the funny part of the story is, I. I wasn't able to leave when everybody was going to leave, so I had testing or something to do somewhere anyway. When I came back, I landed in Los Angeles. Peter Clifford was going to come with us as well, and Peter happened to, I think, be at the Suzuki test that I was at or wherever I was at and whatever I was doing. So he and I got in the truck together, drove down to, to Baja, got on motorcycles that were there waiting for us, rode down to, to, to meet my dad and his buddies and <coughs> Rob Mack, and I forget who all went, but... Uh, we got down to this place where we stay called Mike Sky Ranch, and we got there. We actually drove, actually we drove the truck all the way down. We didn't ride, we just drove the truck, and as we're driving down the road that's about 20 miles into Mike Sky Ranch, start seeing snowfall. I'm like, man, hmm, I think Dad and Rob and all them were supposed to stay in the mountains tonight, kind of just out in the open. They didn't, weren't expecting snow. Anyway, the next morning we're sitting at Mike's thinking, man, they were supposed to, they were supposed to be here pretty early this morning. I wonder where they're at. So. Well, we'll just head out the road because they're definitely going to come in that road. So as we head out, just as we get to the pavement, they show up and Rob Mack is <laughs> just about frozen. He says, your dad's trying to kill me. I'm, I'm never coming back down here again. Um, and then as the ride went further on, he finally thawed out. Um, and we, we did. We actually ran through an area where the two bikes he and I were riding didn't have enough fuel to go the whole distance. So we came up with this great idea. Turn yours off. I'll push you, I'll turn mine off, you can push me, we'll alternate, we won't use both of our tanks of fuel, that way maybe we'll make it to the next stop without having to, you know, be pushed by somebody else. Little did we know that the, uh, and I, I think they were t Yamaha TT350s, and um, what we didn't know was that unless the engine running, there's not anything splashing oil on the gears. And the gear box is locked up on both of them. So yeah, we did, we had to free, find a way to free them up, and. Uh, we managed to make it home, but that's kind of like every story that happens in Baja. It's kind of just day by day. Yeah, I must admit, you told me that I was jealous. You just sounded, he made it sound like the best thing ever. No matter how cold it got with Jim, he said it was just the best riding holiday ever. You know? It is. There used to be a bunch of really fun stuff. It's Can you it's still do it now? You can, but it's all turned into gravel roads, and you know, it's not it's not near the uh, off-road experience that it used to be. We don't have for a question. We must have a question. 
Yeah, sorry, the bar, that's good because Ross has to do a bit of work. <clears throat> in your opinion, who's our best out as a British rider for proper onslaught at Moto GP? Did you get that? That was prob that's, that, 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 that's a bit of Derbyshire for you there, wasn't it? <laughs> When I raced her up till Colonel no, now, he says, he, what he's asking is, do you see a Brit coming through that can actually win more GPs? <laughs> Careful. <laughs> I think Scott Redding. I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, Cal, we'll know next year. I mean, he'll be on a good bike next year and we'll be able to see a little bit more of what Cal's all about then. Um, but do I think Scott, if he continues on with the path that he's on, riding Hondas and you know, in 2016, we're going to all be a little bit closer because not everybody's going to have the experience that they have. Machines are going to be a bit more equal. Everybody's going to be on a different brand of tire. What that's yet to be. Has it been determined yet? I mean, they keep talking about Michelin, but I don't think it's actually... It's not deal done, is it? Yeah, it's not deal done. Um, you know, and, and Scott, as young as he is, um, you know, he's been on that on that production-based bike. He's been the fastest guy just, just about every weekend. Nicky and him mix it up quite a bit, but, uh, you know, I think Scott... If he continues to learn at the rate that he's learning at, I think Scott could win some Grand Prix. He had quite an impressive weekend, I thought, as well. It was, what, second off a mark, is in Paul, and... Uh, yeah, he made top 12, didn't he? Yeah, mm -hmm. good, good run. But yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I'll tell you something else about how you met Scott. You know, cocky kid, when he was coming up through 125, yeah, he was a cocky lad. Hard work. I had to interview him loads of times and I, I didn't like doing it. He obviously read a lot of press about himself and believed every word. But he changed completely. He must have grown up. I don't know what happened. But I had to go and interview him before bike show last year, NEC last year. Like, what, eight months ago. And we had to go to Spain to meet him. Whoa. It just turned into a nice blow. Very humble and asked him some questions where it would have been easy for him to be cocky and full of himself. Spot on. Absolutely spot on. Dead, dead impressed with him. You know. So yeah, Scott Red did, did do for me as well. Jamie? Jamie, I think I've got another question. One minute. Bloody hell yeah. Oh yeah. Kevin, have you rode the new GP bike? I did. I tested it uh, right after the MotoGP race in Austin. Competitive, yeah? How would I know? <laughs> you know yeah, to, to me it feels like it should be, but you know I haven't ridden. I, I did uh, last MotoGP bikes in a row was before they put 990s away in 06, end of 06. I got to ride Nicky Hayden's World Championship Honda. I got to ride Pedrosa's bike. I got to ride Rossi's bike. I got to ride the Kawasaki. I got to ride Vermeulen Suzuki. I got to I got to ride run through the whole gamut of them, and wasn't really that impressed with any of them. The, the thing that I had the most fun riding was I got to ride Lorenzo's 250, and uh, you know, a little 110 horsepower, 100 kilo, two-stroke uh, 250 that just stopped and turned on a dime. That was the most fun thing that I had that day. Do you think you did a very good 250 rider? You know, I did, and you said I had never ridden anything but a Suzuki. I rode a Ducati once, it broke my collarbone, uh, and I rode a Honda 250 once at Laguna Seca uh, in just an American championship round, and I crashed it. <laughs> so, yeah, I enjoyed riding a 250. I tested the Suzuki 250 um, in 92 when Wilco, Zeelenberg, and Harry Torrentegi rode it, uh, and they were complaining about top speed, and we got to test it at Barcelona. And I got a really good drive through the last turn and drafted past the factory Honda of Carduce down the front straight, and everybody went, hmm, doesn't look like it's slow to me. <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed riding a smaller bike. Um, so yeah, I, I think I could have been okay. But I had to maybe cut some off my legs and arms a little bit to, yeah, you to fit on one. Into it, <laughs> yeah. Do you ever, uh, often wonder, do you ever, do you keep in touch with any of your old sparring partners? Do you ever, I know America's a big place, I'm not from. Not really. I mean, I bump into Rainey whenever he either comes to Austin or if I go to Laguna or if we happen to be at a Grand Prix together. Um, otherwise, you know, nobody talks to Lawson. Not even his wife. <laughs> uh, you know, I bump into doing every now and then. Actually, on my 50th birthday, Mick, uh, I, I looked in at my phone. I had to put my glasses on to make sure it read correctly. It was actually a, a text from Mick Dillon saying, Happy 50th. Uh, he says, We made it halfway there. And I thought, we don't, we're not going to make it all the way to 100, are we? <laughs> but, um, you know, and Beatty and I are still pretty good buddies. We talk. He's doing a big off-road adventure company now, yeah. traveling, doing off-road rides. From I wanted to go after Suzuka, but um, my mindset wasn't all that great after not getting to ride. Uh, he was doing a, one from 
East Coast or West Coast, and they were supposed to be about halfway across. But uh, yeah, BD and I are probably the ones that stay in touch the most. Barry, I saw him a couple of years ago. Went to Brazil to do a school. Um, got to work in with his track day, and uh, you know, Alex is still riding a lot and still as fast as he's ever been. So I know you used to, uh, used to come and see Rob Mack every time in the UK. Generally, I called him and I told him I was coming to Donington. I said, "You planning on coming?" He goes, "No." <laughs> so I don't know. Um, of course, had lunch with uh, the the better half of the McKenzie family. N Neil's up at Knock Hill today for a track day, so yeah, didn't, get to, didn't get to see him absolutely. And, yeah. and Taryn. Yeah. Um, no question. Who's the next young American to call? Don't know. You know, we've got. I think we've got a bunch of really good kids. Um, it, remember when I talked earlier about somebody calling and ask you to ride something, you jump at the opportunity, whether it was a pogo stick or a decent bike. Um, yeah, I, I think we've all gotten, they've all, I'm not going to say we, they've all gotten to where if it's not the best bike there is on the grid, they, yeah, you know, it probably doesn't make sense to me to go ride it. I'm going to go over and not do well. Whereas, you know, I think it's just the opposite of that. If, you take every opportunity that's, that, that's presented to you, you're going to get on something, you're going to shine somewhere, and somebody's going to see it. Just like the opportunity to go ride a 500 that, that Barry asked me to ride, to do whatever I did at Mallory Park. If not, who knows, I may have been an American Superbike racer my entire life, which that wouldn't have been much fun. But, um, you know, you've got to, I think just as in any situation in life, you've got to take a chance every now and then. And uh, You know, there's a few kids, there's a young kid, Nick McFadden doing some dirt track, J.D. Beach, Jake Gagne, Benny Solis, um, you know, we're all Red Bull Rookies Cup kids uh, when I coached for the series we had in 2008 in America. Um, do they have the ability? Yeah. Do they have the, the heart and the mindset to do it? Yeah. You know, until you, until you get some kid in Europe that's, you know, left family, friends, everybody behind, whatever he's got to do to be here, uh, it, it's really hard to tell what kind of character they really are. But yeah, I mean, I think we've got just as much speed as we've ever had in America, uh, as far as racers go. We just haven't got the right channel or the right avenue to get them to where we need to get them so they get recognized. What's, what's, what's going wrong with the uh, um, use of the strongest championship with the strongest riders? You know, I think uh, more than anything, and I'm just going to, the, the AMA took and took racing back in-house. They took it away from a pro racing board of directors, which I was on. Um, but, you know, when they took it back in-house and started making all the rules themselves, instead of having it set between a bunch of different manufacturers and a bunch of people that knew something about racing, now they come up with their own ideas and do things that they think's right. Um, you know, they've hired a few people that have worked with race teams um, that, that, that are doing a decent job. But I think there is, um, there's just no respect there because so many of the manufacturers knew what it was like before and that same group of guys is still there now and the AMA's changing things and they're not making rules that they're talking to the manufacturers about. They're not finding out what bikes you want to race and what classes you want to participate in and what what is it that the manufacturers want from racing. Until we get manufacturer support back into the AMA, uh, the AMA series is going to continue to dwindle. Can, can people make money from racing in America? <coughs> Towards the end of my career, I meant to do World Super Sport after I couldn't get a job at World Super Bike. I got offered, for me, really good money to go and race a Ducati in the AMA. And so if they were doing that, there were people, quite a lot of people earning decent money then, and that doesn't seem that long ago. When was it? Yeah, it's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> what year? Uh, that would be 2000. Yeah, you know, I, I think 02, 03, 04, um, you know, Maladin and Speeds were both probably taking home a couple million bucks a year. You know, there was TV coverage for every race. The championship was an absolute battle. There was Honda trucks, Yamaha trucks, Suzuki trucks, Kawasaki trucks, Ducati trucks. Everybody was there. Everybody was competing. And, um, you know, it's it's been since, since then. Of course, we had the big turn in the economy in 2008. Um, and so that's really keeping the manufacturing getting back involved. But I think even if the manufacturers did really want to support racing, I don't think it's the AMA that they're going to support right now. There's too much, there's too much uncertainty in where the series is going and what the direction is. I mean, it's been 600s now is the Daytona 200. Well, next year it's going back to 1,000. 
And well, what's that spec going to be? I don't know. Who's going to build the tire? Well, we don't know. We're going to have to make a pit stop every 10 laps. Um, you know, there's there's just too much going on there that that I think um, you know, even though that it, it's the American end of things that makes the decision on whether the manufacturers get involved, the Japanese kind of still oversee it and go, bad, bad idea, guys. So um, I'm not sure what it's going to take to cure it. Uh, maybe complete change of ownership and you know, complete. Uh, cleaning of the house at the AMA and bring a bunch of people in that do know something about racing. Get it brought back in front of a board so that the board makes the decision about it instead of just one person who could really have uh, a certain manufacturer or so uh, in, in the process. So, I'd... go to Europe, go racing. Come to come race, BS, come race BSB if a kid asks me. We've got a couple of good Americans in BSB and one that's been through uh, BSB uh, called P.J. Jacobson, and in my opinion, he's not doing himself justice at the minute, but he's, he's, he's a good kid. He's, he's definitely capable of winning World Super Sport rounds, if not more. He came over and, and really set the world on fire at the end of last year, didn't he? Well, yeah. jumped, jumped on the Super Stock bike, won it. Jumped on Super Sport, won it. This is a BSB level. And then he did really well last year in, uh, in BSB class for his first year, and then went to World, decided to go, he won a World Championship aspirations, went to... Uh, Super Sport World Championship on a decent bike actually but he had a couple of crashes that he couldn't actually figure out he's quite analytical he's not no disrespect to you but he's not the type who just jump out of the gravel trap limp back to his second bike and go again he's I've, I've chatted with him a bit and he needs to figure out what's happened and he's, he's, so he's, he's knocked his confidence a bit he's getting back to it though yeah and it I, I think every time I crashed a bike I learned something from it as quick as I got back on the next bike whether I learned it before I got back on the other bike and maybe I want to crash the next bike as well. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, that's when you have time to, to download and try and figure out what it is that happened during the day. And, you know, it's, uh, I tore up a bunch of stuff. I scratched up a bunch of leathers. I kind of beat up my body a little bit. But, uh, you know, everything I did, I learned from. And I think that's why I, we, we did as good as we did. Yeah, but it's, 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 having the, it's having the metal to go and put yourself in that position straight back again that some people can't do and some can't. You know what I'm saying? True. Yeah. One well, last question from the floor, then we're gonna move on a little bit because yeah. we have to be chatting a while now. If you were just getting into top flight racing now, would you still want to go to GPs or in for world superbikes? I'd have to go world superbike racing because there's no chance of winning in MotoGP. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, either or. You know, I, it, it's, it, it would be a learning process no matter which which series I went to or anybody goes to. Uh, you know, do I get along with Johnny and a bunch of the World Superbike guys? Yeah. Leon, would I like to go rub elbows with him? Yeah, I did a little bit at Suzuka in practice and stuff. Um, would I like the chance to race Rossi on the same machinery? Maybe. Would I want to race Rob Marquez on the same bike? Absolutely not. <laughs> I think I'd, I'd end up right, right in the same position everybody else has been in. That's either second or further back. So. Um, and I think both championships are pretty strong right now. Doesn't seem like uh, World Superbike's quite getting the attendance that it needs or it deserves. It's, that's true, it's decent. There's well, nobody going to watch, watch it. Porter, I don't know watch the race at Port. I mean, yeah, the great weather wasn't great at Porto Mayo, but you know, there was, uh, there's more people here. Yeah, there's <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, there were more people in the paddock than in the bleachers at Porto Mayo. Tragic. I don't know. They went, we, I went to a press conference, sat through an hour chatting about what they're going to do with the rules. And I asked the question at the end, what are you going to do about getting the crowds back? Now, mind the rules. Just because you get the rules right does not mean they're going to come back because the racing's pretty good as it is. Yeah. And nobody had a, an answer. I don't know what it is. It's expensive to go and watch, um, to watch World Superbike when you can go watch your BSB, more races, more action, certainly more incidents. Which just means ticket prices are too expensive, which yeah. means the promoters having to put a price on a ticket to try and cover the sanction fee. Yeah, that's the thing. The sanction fee, that's the price that the circuit pays to put on. And you know what? The sad thing was, the, the World Superbike organisers, who uh, are now the same people as organised MotoGP, could, didn't have an answer. They said, well, it's not our problem. It's not our problem how the circuits get their money back and get the crowds in. That's their problem. So they didn't really care that only you know, 3,000 people went to watch. They're not bothered. Which, to me, is just waiting for a big sort of meltdown. But anyway. Uh, right, we're gonna, we're gonna, sorry, we're getting, I'm getting on with fucking talk box. Actually, I was thinking about it, World Superbike. When you watch it, there's loads of British in it. Now, it's great for us British to watch that, but is there a lack of interest in 
uh, world to provide from a uh, also from an American point, and also for all the other rest of the world. I take that back. I don't want to go to World Series bike either because Sykes will just kick my ass there. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're going to um, move it on. I think Ross is going to introduce the guys who's brought the bikes down here. Yeah, uh, our two stroke Sunday event that we ran uh, uh, several several weeks ago now. Uh, this bike turned up uh, later on in the afternoon. Uh, really impressed. Lots of people gathered around it. After we'd done the top 10 uh, trophies for uh, Two Strokes Sunday, that one turned up, so it unfortunately it, didn't, it wasn't eligible. And uh, I didn't get the, uh, the telephone number of the rider who was on it. And, uh, and then, then we found out Kevin's coming to CMT. I think I've got to get all of that bike. How do I, how do I get all of it? So, a lot of research on the internet and eventually found out the guy who built the bike. Uh, and from that, phoned him up and then was able to find out the guy who commissioned the bike. Uh, who very kindly allowed me to call down to his house and collect it, but also let me know that his friend and colleague had this one. Which, again, I to collect that very nice. So actually, I'd just like to invite Rob and uh, Nick uh, oh, just to tell us a little bit about these bikes. They didn't know Kevin Trons were coming tonight, but very kindly borrowed us these so we could have a look at them. Part of the deal, I did say that Kevin would sign the back of the bikes for him, so if, he, if Kevin could apply that, that would be great. But firstly, uh, Rob, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your bikes? Thanks for that, Kevin. Um, well, uh, we're both big into two strokes, and um, we thought uh, it'd be nice to, to have like a top two stroke, so uh, the obvious choice is an RG500, but uh, the thing with the RG500, everybody knows, is that the Standard chassis is not really up to the, you know, the standard of the engine. So uh, we did a little bit of digging around on the internet, and originally we we're going to uh, use uh, VJ22 frames, um, but in the end uh, we found that the Spondon uh, frames are still available. So uh, you found some really nice pictures, didn't we? We saw the. Uh... <laughs> The banana swing arm on this, and uh, we thought, yeah, that looks really sweet. We've got to have, we've got to have that. Yeah, so um, uh, we found a chap, uh, Darren Lane, his name is, uh, based in Cheshire, and he's uh, he'd been stockpiling RG500 engines for a long while, and um, you know he agreed to build it for us. So uh, we've got a couple of rolling chassis frames for him. Spondon Engineering, Stuart Tiller, and uh, he said, well, um, we can supply um, the forks and the wheels and the tank, so you've got everything you need, and then you just need the engine and the bodywork and everything else, and that's the difficult bit, but uh, Darren Lane sorted out for us. So, uh, I mean, I, I was always after a, a Pepsi uh, RGV, and uh, I'd, I'd, although I'd looked for a number of years, I hadn't found one. So uh, I thought, well, I'll have mine in Pepsi, uh, colour scheme. And, uh, yeah, I like Nick said it's in the Lucky Strike. Yeah. So here it is. Who's, which one's fastest? <laughs> <laughs> well, mine's, out. mine's not very fast, but me on it. Uh, <laughs> uh, we did have an article in the uh, Practical Sports Bike, didn't we? And, uh, that's right. Uh, yeah. A nine page article. And they took some very, uh, very nice photographs. To be them. honest, the, 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 the credit to you and the attention to detail is uh, unreal. They're really, you need to have a, a, a close look at uh, these things. Are they rideable? Are they practical to run? Oh yeah, I mean, when Darren built the engines for us, he said, uh, how, how much power do you want out of this uh, RG500, uh, the engine? Because he, he said, uh, you know, if I make you race, you, just, uh, you will really struggle even to take off from the lights because you'll be giving it, like, 10,000 revs just to get going. And so, we said, <laughs> so we said, no, we want it to be sensible. So um, we said, just to, to, well, we want it to be faster than a, a normal one. And, uh, we had them uh, on the, where do we take them to? We had them on the, on the dyno, yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you, Russ. Step on it, Kevin. <laughs> We had them on the dyno and uh, they the pump out at about uh, 110 horsepower at the uh, back wheels. 
and uh, they come in at under 150 kilos each, so they're, they're still Yeah, that's a, that's a sham motorbike, is that? It's a what? It's a sham motorbike, is that, for the power to weight wise? Yeah. yeah. It's still a bit lordy compared to Kevin's uh, proper race bike, of course. Yeah, well, you just you'd hurt yourself with that. <laughs> I guarantee you. Well, the credit to you boys, and thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Boys, we get them signed by the man, and I think now we're going to do some autographs. Yeah, where we're going to do that? <laughs> All right, yeah. Give us a minute. Amuse yourselves, will you? Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> To do with the autographs actually from the where it says parts department the queue needs to go this way up to the sales office so you can work your way around if you have got something to sign we'll show that we can get it signed for you but also we have got some uh, uh, pictures that we have made up to so just work your way around we need the queue to go from parts department this way into the sales uh, into the sales office but before you do that we need you to put your hands together for Kevin Schwartz Is that bigger than the, than the real deal? It feels long here to here. Does it feel like home? Yeah, it's, it's big because it used to be really tight getting elbows in front of this. Now, 